Thank you. Um, I've already learned something on this panel. Um, dementia is a big problem in my country, in Norway, but I actually didn't know that there are more new cases of dementia in low- and middle-income countries than in high-income countries. And that, in a way, brings us to what I would like to share with you, and that's whether countries have the sufficient means to address the needs in the healthcare system. So I would like to thank the organizers of the World Health Summit, uh, and also thank the Chatham House Center for Global Health Security for, yeah, the organizers for giving me the floor here, and the, the Chatham House Center for actually giving me the opportunity to lead a process of analysis and uh, deliber deliberations that I would like to share with you. Shared responsibilities for health. Um, I will start with trying to motivate what I will present to you. So five key questions on global health financing, because this is really focused on the macroeconomic uh, perspective uh, and the macro perspective on health, uh, and first and foremost on the needs of low and middle income countries. So first, why? We already heard by Michael Gerber, the first presenter on the panel, that the key reason for why we need to invest in health is the moral case. Health is a human right, so it's an intrinsic value to health that all nations have kind of adopted and have agreed upon. But we shouldn't forget that there is big business cases, to put it bluntly, big instrumental issues, instrumental values of actually investing in health. And we've just presented the large societal costs related to disease, a disease like dementia. So that as a starting point, we use both of these motivations for why we need to focus on health financing. Then how? I would not cover the, the whole debate on universal health coverage, but let's say that we took that as granted, as kind of an ag agreed global consensus for the need of universal health coverage and universal health systems that can both provide financing but also provide care, including prevention and promotion of health. But for what? When you talk about a global perspective, it's easy to talk about, which will be done in the next session, I understand, on global health financing, focusing on the big international initiative. Our starting point here is the first point we need to address is the domestic financing of national health systems. Those are the key contributors to global health, because without functioning financing systems and healthcare systems in all countries, we have no chance of actually achieving global health. But we also need to address joint financing of global public goods for health, which was also alluded to by a previous speaker on this panel. But finally, there is also a need to focus on external financing for national health systems when national capacities are not sufficient. And I will try to cover all of those three needs. And who should we address these kind of health financing needs to? They should be addressed to governments. Coming back to both the moral case and the business case, there's national governments who are responsible. But governments are, at least in most countries, democratically elected by their voters. So in a way, we are all accountable to achieving goals like this, as voters and as citizens. Our perspective is that there are shared responsibilities then, both within countries, as kind of a national public system, a national kind of system of citizens, we have a shared responsibility within our country, but there's also shared responsibilities between countries, uh, and in particular when countries do not have sufficient national capacities. So in a way we have shared but also differentiated responsibilities. And the key question then is how much? So what we set out to do was try to set some clear goals and targets, some international norms on how we can think about and discuss and maybe also conclude on global health financing. And I hope that has kind of demonstrated the need for a case for global, a global framework that is capable of securing sufficient and sustainable financing and of both mobilizing and use it, using it efficiently and equitably within countries. So a simple way to demonstrate it is uh, through this graph. It's the GDP per capita, so how rich a country is on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, and it's the need of funding for health on the y-axis or the vertical axis. So we try to set up a financing floor, at least a floor that all citizens of the world would need to have financed, pool financed, pre, mandatory prepaid pool financing to make sure that they have 
a basic health care system which can provide for them when in need. But we also set out to define investment norms. How much should countries invest in health? Uh, and of course that, as they become richer, countries are able to invest more in absolute terms. And finally, there may be then a gap between a financing floor and the expected uh, investments countries can be expected to make. So first on domestic financing. So we talk about mobilizing more resources first. We took as a starting point two previous works, two commissions, one commission on macroeconomics and health, and the other is the high-level task force on health systems financing. They are some years uh, ago, and we uh, updated calculations, and in particular utilized the high-level task force on financing for health systems. And by updating those numbers to uh, 2013 numbers, uh, and really seeing that this is coverage for a primary health care, comprehensive primary health care, uh, and also health promotion, we came up with a figure of $86 per capita as the financing floor. So what is the current situation? If you plot the current domestic investments in health, those are demonstrated here. And these are different countries uh, uh, categorized based on how rich they are. We see that many countries fall behind that financing floor. So there is a huge gap in financing. It's a huge gap in means countries have or are willing to set aside to health. And that gap is $196 billion, a huge gap. So what can we do about that? There has been set national norms for financing of health. The Abuja target set that 15% of national, uh, or government's national budgets should go to health. Only a few countries have met that goal set by themselves. That those are the African countries, because it's hard. But we raised the question whether maybe not government expenditures are not the best way to mobilize and, and actually measure the investments in health. Because when you look at countries and you look at the total government expenditures or government revenues, you see that countries' uh, revenues to governments vary a lot as measured as a pr proportion of GDP in the country. They vary from 15% up to above 50%. So proportion of national government revenues is not the best measure. We wanted to measure this as a proportion of GDP. So if you take a proportion of GDP as a measure of health expenditures, you see a big variation also there when it comes to countries. But based on some calculations I will not go into, we decided on a target of 5% of GDP because that links Countries that invest above that level are achieving at least the basic health indicators already alluded to by the MDGs. So if we take that norm and put it on this graph, so 5% of GDP, we see that many countries will need to in increase their investments and the gap will be reduced to 65 billion, from 196 to 65 billion. But it's not, not only enough to provide more resources. We also need to think about how we provide the resources. We need to shift from out-of-pocket payments towards prepaid mandatory pooled funding. And we need to improve priority setting and efficiency of healthcare systems. So it's a combined effort in countries when they go on the pathway towards health, universal health coverage. So that was the domestic financing. The second area was global public goods for health, joint financing for global public goods for health. And we already heard from Michael Gerber that the, pers the shift needing to leave no one behind and universality demonstrates the need to look also look into global public goods. Because we need co-financing of health information systems, surveillance systems, preparedness and response systems, and research and development. The Ebola crisis have demonstrated what can happen when we don't have a preparedness and response system at a global level. The lack of drugs for dementia or other diseases, neglected diseases, demonstrates what happens when we don't have a clear global system for innovation. So we need also to support institutions collaboratively. WHO capacity is one. And thirdly, we need to support an enabling environment 
which actually makes it feasible for countries to raise the domestic revenues. So that talks about uh, capping illicit financial flows, avoiding tax havens, and so forth. Then to the third area, external financing. So the primary role of external financing in this framework would be, in a way, to correct the gap of 65 billion. Because even if now developing countries and the lowest low-income uh, countries are increasing domestic expenditures, we cannot expect them to raise sufficient money based on their current GDP.